Hello, in this video I'm going to be looking at quite a classic algorithm, line of sight, also known as shadow casting. And as usual, I'm going to start by showing you what it is that I'm talking about. So here I have an arena uh, where there's a boundary defined in blue. And if I hold down my right mouse button, I can shine a light in this arena. And as I move the mouse around, I can see that the light is following the mouse cursor. This is all done in the Pixel Game Engine, by the way. With the left mouse button, I can draw shapes. So I'm going to draw uh, a boundary here. And you can see it's, it's sort of a, a tile map array. And the nice thing is now, when I hold down the right mouse button and turn the light on, we can see that the boundaries cast shadows. Well, they cast shadows, but they also indicate the locations that can't be seen from where the mouse cursor is. So this is also line of sight. And it behaves quite nicely. I'll add in a few more features and see how it behaves. And all of the features cast their own shadows. In fact, we can add lots and lots and lots of features. And you'll see some of them are little boundaries and walls, and we can extend things out, got lots of interesting shapes. It doesn't matter. The algorithm can quite happily deal with any layout of tiles. I'll make here at the bottom a small enclosure. And the algorithm behaves as you might reasonably expect it to. As we enter the enclosure, visibility of the rest of the field is restricted to the doorway. And in fact, if we close off the doorway, of course we can't see outside the little room. Line of sight is very useful in strategy games. So here I've developed a little corridor, and I'm going to push the agent through the corridor, and we can see he can only see what's inside the corridor as he's moving around. Now I think that's a really cool algorithm, and my implementation of it is one of several methods you can use. So let's take a look at how it's done, but before we get started, this is uh, my very first Pixel Game Engine exclusive video. So I'd like to spend some time just showing you how to set up a Pixel Game Engine project using Visual Studio. Now I know that for many of you, this is all old hat and you know what you're doing, but you'll be surprised. I get quite a few comments, people saying they don't really know how to set up Visual Studio, so please forgive the next couple of minutes whilst I do this. When you start Visual Studio, you'll be presented with the Start page. I recommend going to File, New, and selecting Project. In the list of projects, you'll see one is called a Windows Console application. Give the solution a name. I'm going to call this one Shadow Casting 2D, and press OK. Now, Visual Studio, and this is the very latest version of Visual Studio, will go ahead and create some files for you. And it even gives you some hints as to what these files are for. For my videos, though, I don't really want the file structure it provides. The first thing I want to do is get rid of the pch.h file and the pch.cpp file. So I select them and press delete. I don't want them. I'm not going to use pre-compiled headers. This also then means I have to get rid of the include pch.h from the main. Whilst I'm at it, I'm going to get rid of all of these comments too. We need to tell it that we don't want to use pre-compiled headers in our project. So go to project properties and make sure we've got debug selected up here, and expand the C and C++ option. Go to pre-compiled headers, and in the tab where it says use pre-compiled headers, we're going to say not using pre-compiled headers, and click apply. Whilst we're here, you might also want to do the same thing for release. Now I know it's very controversial, but the next thing I want to do is actually include the STD namespace. And the only reason I do this is because it's easier to make videos that appear clearer. Best practice is not to do this. We're creating a Pixel Game Engine application, so at this point you probably need to go to the One Lone Coder GitHub and download the header file, and here it is, olc pixelgameengine.h. Grab this file and copy it into the folder that you created when you created a new solution. So on my machine, this is the Shadow Casting 2D folder, I've pasted the header file into this location. I then want to include that file in my source code. 
And now there is one last little thing that we need to do, which was different from the console game engine. And this is currently experimental, so you may not always need to do this, but uh, right now it's something I'm trying out. And that is before we include the Pixel Game Engine file, we need to define our application as being one that uses the Pixel Game Engine. And we do that by doing hash define olc underscore pge underscore application. And we need to do that before we include the header file. And the reason that I'm taking this approach is that instead of having a separate object orientated version of the Pixel Game Engine, I'm trialing just using a single header file, which means we need somewhere in all of our compiled code an actual implementation of the Pixel Game Engine. And that will be wherever we have defined this constant OLC PGE application. Now, as most of my videos are a single file solution, um, I will just want to define this constant at the top of my main file. Next, I want to override the OLC Pixel Game Engine base class. This is just the same as the console game engine and was shown in the OLC Pixel Game Engine video. So thanks for putting up with that. I just needed a little bit of a video reference for the people that ask those questions. So let's carry on. Now we've got the basic structure in place, I'm going to create an object of type shadow casting and call the construct function. And I want to construct a pixel game engine with resolution, it's pretty high now, 640 by 480, where each pixel is 2x2 two two screen pixels. And if that's successful, then start the engine. At this point, you may want to do a test compile and run, just to make sure everything's set up correctly. And we should see a black screen of the dimensions we've just specified. Very nice. Now this is a bit of a two-for-one video, because to implement shadow casting or line of sight, we really need two algorithms. I like the convenience of being able to draw the worlds in tiles. Placing blocks is quite intuitive, as we saw with the Jario platforming game, you could have a selection of blocks and place them wherever you want. But the shadow casting algorithm itself relies heavily on geometry, and if we had to do geometry for all of the blocks every single frame, well, I feel that that's not very efficient. So the first stage of the algorithm is to convert our tile map of blocks into a polygon map of edges. Here, I've drawn out an arbitrary section of level, or world, uh, based on a tile map, so you can see where I've placed the blocks and where I haven't placed the blocks in the background. This is very convenient, as it makes life easy for the level developer, it's easy to draw particular sprites in set locations, we've done collisions with tile maps before, there's lots of advantages to using a tile map, but we don't want to use the geometry of every single block edge to cast shadows, because at any given moment there's a lot of edges. Instead, what we prefer to see is the boundary of the clusters of blocks. So we're going to come up with an algorithm that will turn a cluster of blocks into a polygon. We're going to find the bounding edge of this block. Now, I can look at this block and intuitively say, well, we've got a, a vertex here and a vertex here, a vertex here, one here, one here, 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 and here. We also have four more vertices here. And in principle, what I'd like to do is link these vertices with lines. And I think it's quite easy to see now that there are far fewer boundary lines than there are uh, block edges. Once we move out of the blocky world of the tile map into the smooth world of the polygon, there are lots of other advantages we get as well. We could implement realistic physics and collision detection. We can have edges which don't align with the natural tile boundaries in the world. And of course, we can have natural looking gradients and slopes. I think we'll see a lot more of this algorithm popping up in future videos. I want to construct these polygon boundaries in the most efficient way possible. So ideally, given a cutout of the larger world, I want to scan through it once to create the set of edges. And so that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to start from the top left, and I'm going to scan horizontally across the screen, and when I get to one end, I'm going to come back to the start and scan the next row. In this simplified example, the structure that I have for a particular cell in the tile map is quite simple. It either exists or it doesn't. So in some sort of cell structure, I know I'm going to have a boolean for exist. But in order to implement my algorithm, I'm going to need some additional information. I'm going to add four more booleans, which tell me, do the edges exist? 
and these relate to the north, south, east and west edges. And as we saw at the start, a cell may share an edge with other cells. This implies that any given cell can't actually own an edge. Instead it must use one that's stored elsewhere. So I'm going to also include four integers which represent the ID of a given edge on the north, south, east or west sides from some edge pool that we'll create elsewhere. So let's start manually going through the algorithm. Firstly, we want to check, does the cell we're currently inspecting exist? Because this cell doesn't exist, this cell doesn't exist, etc, 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 all the way along in our world, until we get to one that does exist. We only care about cells that exist. So we're going to apply tests to this cell. And the first test that we'll try, from the perspective of this cell, is do I have a western neighbour? Well, in this situation, clearly I don't have a western neighbour, so I definitely have a western edge. But where do I get this edge from? Well, the only other place an edge could come from is from a northern neighbour that also has a western edge. And in effect, we'll take that edge and grow it downwards. In this situation, we don't have a northern neighbour, so we're going to create a new edge. And so we'll add to our edge pool edge A. And in our cell structure, we'll link our edge ID to the location of the edge in the edge pool. We'll now systematically check the other sides of the tile. Firstly, we'll check the eastern edge. So if I have an eastern neighbour, which in this case I do, then clearly there isn't an edge necessary between us. We don't need to do anything further. Now we need to check our northern neighbour. Well, I don't have a northern neighbour in this case, so I do need an edge. But where can I get one from? Well, I can either get one from my western neighbour, or I need to create one of my own. And since I don't have a western neighbour, I'm going to have to create one of my own. So we'll create a new edge called B, and we'll give the ID of that edge to the cell. We'll also draw in the A edge there. As you can probably tell already, it's a similar situation for the southern edge too. We're going to need to create one for this cell. C. Now we're traversing from top left to bottom right, so this is the next cell that we check, and we run through exactly the same routine. Do I have a western neighbour? Well I do, so I don't need a western edge. Do I have an eastern neighbour? Well, again, I do. I don't need an eastern edge. Do I have a northern neighbour? No I don't, so I do need an edge, but this time, rather than creating one for myself, what I can see is that my western neighbour currently already has a northern edge. So I'm going to extend that edge to suit my needs, and I'll set my edge ID as well. The final check is, do I have a southern neighbour? Well, I don't. So I do need an edge, and you've probably already guessed, I'm going to grow my western neighbour's edge as well, and set my cell's edge ID on the southern boundary to suit that particular edge. Exactly the same routine occurs for the next cell. So let's run through it again for this corner cell. Well, we check, do I have a western neighbour? I do, so I don't need an edge. Do I have an eastern neighbour? I don't in this case, so I do need an edge. Now, I can't borrow one from my northern neighbour, so I'll have to create one, D. And I'll add that edge to the edge pool and set my ID. Now we check for northern neighbours, and just as we've done with the previous cells, I don't have a northern neighbour, so I do need a northern edge, but fortunately my western neighbour has got one I can borrow. So I will extend that edge and set my ID accordingly. Now for southern neighbours, this is the first time we check for southern, and I've got a southern neighbour, so I don't need an edge between myself and my southern neighbour, which means I no longer need to extend the edge C horizontally. In fact, it's very likely we'll never need to do anything with C again. But we don't have to touch it, it's in the edge pool, it's got a start and an end point, it's done. So we'll move on. The next cell that exists is this standalone cell here. It doesn't have any neighbours. So the consequence of this is it's going to add four new edges to the edge pool. A western edge, an eastern edge, a northern edge, and a southern edge. E, F, G, and H. We'll just set the edge IDs for five six and seven. So the worst case scenario is a map made up of lots of individual blocks. Let's carry on testing but I'm not going to go in as much detail now. The next block tested is this one that does exist. 
Well, this one needs a new western edge, which is I now, that's where we're up to. But it can borrow from its northern neighbour, its eastern edge. And I'll just carry the algorithm along now for the rest of the shape. Once we've gone through all of the tiles we're interested in, we'll have an edge pool that contains only the bounding edges of the shapes. And the edges are defined by a start and an end coordinate. It's very possible that edges will share a coordinate. But needless to say, we've converted our tile map into a set of edges. Not strictly a polygon, because we've not defined what's the inside and the outside of the polygon but we can assume that things don't pass through edges in our application. So I think our first step in code is to implement this algorithm. Now I've gone through it in quite some detail here, I'm not going to go through the same detail in the code, so we'll do some cut and pasting. I will need some basic structures to assist us. The first thing I'll need is an edge which stores the X and Y components of its start and end points. And my world is going to be made up of an array of cells. So this is my cell, and I've included in it boolean flags for does the cell exist or not, and does it have an edge that exists on all four sides, and what is the edge ID into the pool of edges. And just to make the algorithm a little clearer to follow, I'm going to define some constants for north, south, east and west. Our world is going to be a 2D array of cells. The world will be defined by two variables, world width and world height. In this case I've chosen 40 and 30, because if I assume a block size of 16 by 16 pixels, that lines up very nicely with our 640 by 480 resolution. So essentially the world is a single screen that we can see. In on user create, I'm going to allocate the memory that holds our world. Adding code to place blocks in the world is quite simple because we're using the pixel game engine. First, I'm going to define the width of the block, just in case we do want to change things later on. And I'm going to grab a quick snapshot of the mouse coordinates. It's important to do this because the mouse coordinates can technically change whilst this function is executing. So grabbing them right at the start means that we're going to have consistency through the code. To check if the user has pressed the left mouse button or clicked, we can call the get mouse function on item zero. That's the left mouse button. And we're going to check to see, has it been released this frame? If it has been released, we're going to get to the index of the cell that it has been clicked in. Now this looks horrendous, but it's actually quite a simple bit of code. We take our input mouse coordinate and we do an integer divide with the block width. So this will tell us how many blocks down the screen is the mouse cursor. We do the same thing for the x-axis. We take the x mouse coordinate and we also divide that by block width. And that tells us how far across the screen is the mouse cursor in tiles effectively. And this is something we've seen many, many times now. i equals a y coordinate times the width of the array plus x, which converts our 2D x and y coordinates into a 1D coordinate in the array. Once we know the index, we can toggle the exist flag for the cell at that location. Staying in on user update, but I'm going to move it down a bit, we'll do the drawing code. And the first thing I want to do is clear the screen to all black. And now I want to draw the blocks from the tile map. And to do this, I'm going to iterate through them all and simply check if they exist or not. And if they do exist, I'm going to draw a filled in rectangle at that location. So this is converting back from block space into screen space now with a width and height set to the block width. And I'm going to draw the rectangle as blue. Let's take a look. So here we've got the screen with the mouse cursor on. And if I click, wherever I click, I place a blue block. And if I select a blue block and click it, it gets rid of it. We're basically toggling, does the block exist at that location or not? Now we can worry about turning the tile map into a pool of edges. And the container I'm going to use for this is a vector called vec edges. And because I know that doing this type of conversion is going to be incredibly useful for future videos. I'm going to create a function that explicitly does this. It converts a binary tile map into what I'm calling the poly map. I.e. it's going to populate this vector with all of the edge information given a particular region of a tile map. So the parameters to this function are a starting x and y coordinate, 
the width and height of the rectangle of tiles of which I wish to inspect and turn into edges. And I'm also going to pass in the uh, block width parameter so we know where our edges exist in actual space. And then there's this strange parameter called pitch, which is going to be set to n world width, but I'm leaving it as pitch because we want to be able to use it on arbitrary size maps going forward. So I'm using the phrase polymap, it's a little bit made up, and the first thing I'll want this function to do is to clear all of the information associated with constructing this map. Naturally, I want to just clear the vector of edges first. But then, during the construction of creating this vector, we're populating the cells with additional information. I need to reset that information effectively back to zero. So I'm iterating through all of the cells in the region of interest that I'm converting, and for each cell, I'm setting that it has no edges at all, and it's not got any edges in the pool. Again, here we see y times width plus x. Once we've cleared our map, it's time to start applying our algorithm. And I'll do this by creating two for loops, x and y, and iterating through the region of interest. Now you'll notice here I'm actually iterating from 1 to width minus 1 of the region of interest, and that's simply because I don't want to have any out-of-bounds memory errors when I'm checking along the edges of the 2D array. I can get away with that for this demonstration, but going forward I'll probably want to tighten that up a little bit to accommodate genuine array boundaries. Now to stop things getting out of control, I'm going to create some indices which are more convenient to use. So the i index will be the current cell index in the array. We can look at our northern neighbour is the current cell, but up one in the y direction. And our eastern neighbour is the current cell plus one in the x direction. First, let's check if the cell exists or not. If it does exist, we'll check to see does it have a western neighbour, because if it doesn't have a western neighbour, then it needs a western edge. One of the places we can get a western edge from is our northern neighbour by extending it downwards. So let's see if our northern neighbour does that have a western edge. If it does, we'll extend it. And we can extend it by looking at our northern neighbour's western edge ID and using that ID to index into our edge pool. So we can find which edge is on the western side of our northern neighbour. And we know that we're going to grow downwards, so we want to extend the end coordinate of that edge by one block width down, which is what this line does. So in our pool of edges, we're looking at our northern neighbour's western edge ID to get the edge that is relevant to us. We're taking the end y coordinate because we're going to extend in the y axis downwards and we're increasing that coordinate by the height of one of our blocks. Just so happens that our blocks are square. Since we're borrowing an edge that already exists, we'll set the edge ID of our current cell's western edge to be the same as our northern neighbour's western edge. And since the edge exists, we'll set that to true. Now if I didn't have a northern neighbour, I still need an edge from somewhere. So I'll need to create one. We'll create a new edge object. And we can use the position we are in the array and the block width variable to work out where we are in real space. So we can set the start coordinate of our edge, x and y here, using the array coordinates multiplied by the block width. And we know at the moment that our edge is going to be at least one block tall, so we can specify that too. We'll add the edge to our edge pool, simply by pushing it into the vector. And since we've created a new edge, as we did up here we need to now set the ID and whether the edge exists or not for this cell. Well, it's a new edge ID and we've used the location of it in the vector to specify that ID. And so that is all of the code required to work out whether we should create a new western edge or borrow from our northern neighbours. We now need very similar code for the other four edges and I'm not going to talk through it all, I'm going to cut and paste it in, but it's very very similar. We just need to be careful of what we're doing when we're constructing the new edge. So even though I appreciate that seems like a really large amount of code to put in in one go, I hope you can appreciate that it's actually very similar to the one that we've just done. You can probably tell that I'm going a little bit faster than usual on this video, and that's only because there are two parts of the algorithm that I want to include, but I don't want the video to become an hour long. Now we can go back to our onUserUpdate function and actually call our new function to create the polymap. And here I am calling it, and I'm giving it the region of interest that I wish for it to convert, which in this case is the whole array. And I specify the block width coordinate, so the edges can be done to the right scale. And I specify the pitch to be the width of the world, which is actually the same 
as the value I'm using here because coincidentally the whole world is represented by the single screen I can see. I think it'll be quite nice to visualise the edges to help us with some debugging and to make sure that everything is working accordingly. So after we've drawn the blocks, I'm then going to create a little auto for loop to iterate through all of the edges in our vector of edges. And I'll use the draw line function to draw a white line from the starting coordinate to the ending coordinate of the edge. But to make the ends of the edge a little bit more visible, I'm going to draw a red filled in circle at each end. This is the center of the circle, this is the radius, and this is the color. Let's take a look. So here's my blank screen and I'm going to place a block and very nicely we can see we've got at least four edges there. If I place a block next to it we can see it's not drawing any more ends of edges it's just drawing the edge so it does look like in that direction the algorithm is working just fine. If we branch off from here we can see that seems okay too. Let's go off the top. Very nice. If I've inadvertently drawn some offensive symbol here, I do apologise, but I'm just randomly clicking where I need to click. I think what's probably also worth checking is solid objects, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a wall one tile thick. It does seem to work for that too. In fact, we can punch a hole in the middle of this solid. So I'm reasonably confident that we have taken the tile map and we have reduced it into some geometric primitives which might be more useful for doing more complicated geometric maths. Now that's very nice and the performance seems quite reasonable too, especially given I'm doing this every single frame that I'm rendering. And in most cases you probably wouldn't need to do that, you'd only need to regenerate the poly map if the tile map changes. And in some situations it could be a completely offline pre-compilation step of how your level data is stored. So all in all, I think this is a very useful routine to have. Right, so let's start thinking about the shadow casting and the line of sight bit. Here, I've got a location of the source of the light or where the player stands or whatever it is. We're going to project rays from this source radially out into the scene. Now I've covered casting rays before. In fact, in one of my very first videos, the first person shooter of the command line engine we can cast rays in all angular directions and see what they hit. So here we go, cast out some rays. Not very straight rays I might add, but when they intersect with something in the scene the ray length is shorter and anything that followed that ray length past the intersection point is technically in shadow. And finally this one is also in shadow and I'm sure you can envisage a scenario where we keep doing this all the way around the scene. But this is really computationally inefficient. And in fact we can look at this and derive from it that we're only interested in rays that intersect with our line segments. Even more so, we're only interested in rays that seem to intersect with the corners. So let's explore that for a moment. For each edge in the edge pool, I'm going to project a ray to the start and end point. So in this case, I've effectively got four rays. When the ray intersects with the line, we know that the ray effectively starts turning into shadow. But let's consider not looking at areas which are in shadow, but instead which areas are in light. The second ray down was defined by this coordinate, but we can see that it had to intersect with another edge on its way there. And so we'll record the intersection point that is closest to the source of the array. And we'll do that for all four rays cast out. And in fact, let's do the same for all rays for the other object too. So we cast rays to each of the vertices defined by the edges of the other object. I'll draw in the intersection points that are closest along that ray. If I add in one more point, which is the source, what I've actually constructed is a fan of triangles. There's one triangle, next triangle, and these triangles construct a polygon which covers the area that is definitely visible from the source. The problem is it's a bit of a strange polygon because if I shaded in this polygon with light we can see there's some big gaps 
which are definitely visible, but they've been ignored by the algorithm. What can we do about these big gaps then? Well, there's a little hack that we can apply. Instead of casting one ray from the source to a vertex, we cast three rays. One goes directly to it, and we have one either side displaced by a tiny fracture of an angle. So it'll miss the vertex, in this case, on that side. And on this side, well, it'll just hit the line as it normally does. So three rays, one is at theta, and one is at theta plus or minus some tiny little amount. These additional rays will affect our image here in the following way. So we'll have one of the rays will continue going until it hits something else or it hits the boundary of the world. As will this one, and this one, and this one. Our intersection points are also recorded, and now when we draw the triangle fan formed by these points, there's a lot more area to fill in. And in fact, it, it turns out that it's all of the visible area from the source. And this is why these two algorithms are interchangeable, because the lit up area is the line of sight. It's all the areas that can be seen. And the areas that can't be seen must be in shadow. So we have cast shadows. Whilst I was researching into this topic, I found two brilliant websites. You must go and have a look at them. They outline these algorithms in quite some detail and have lots of interactive demos you can play with too. I will, of course, link to these websites in the text below. The first one allows you to place a light source, much like the demo that we're building, and you can see it has a degree of complexity to it. But it's quite nice because it talks through all of the different stages that you might go through when developing this algorithm. This is the second one, and again, a really nice site uh, full of nice toys to play with, and some code too. Uh, and you can see, again, you can interact just as we're doing with edges and shapes and seeing where the rays get cast. In fact, it was this website that gave me the idea of casting out additional rays for the corners. Please take the time to check out these sites. I think it's a wonderful thing that experienced developers are taking the time and putting the effort into actually doing tutorials like this with interactive elements. It's a lot of work and yet yields so much. So check them out. The links are in the description below. So going back to our application, we know that for each edge end, we're going to send out three rays and we're going to form some triangles from the intersection points of those rays with the edges. I'm going to start by creating another function to encapsulate the calculation of our visibility polygon. So There's going to be a set of points that represents the visible space from a source location defined by OX and OY over a given radius. But I'm going to use a little bit of modern C to help me out here. I'm going to store the points of this polygon as a vector of tuples of floats. And you'll notice there are three floats. The first float is going to represent the angle from the source of the vertex that we're targeting with the ray. And the second two floats are the x and y location of that vertex. We need to store the angle because without it we won't be able to draw sensible triangles in the fan later on. Since we're going to iterate through our vector of edges to work out the coordinates to where we should cast rays, this could theoretically happen in any sort of order. Which means when I come to draw these triangles later on, I can't do it sensibly. I effectively need to draw these points in some rotational order. And so the easiest way to do that is not just to store the point on its own, but take an arbitrary axis from our source point and record the theta values of each of the points. So for each point I'll have a theta and an x and a y. I can then sort these points based on the theta value to make sure that they're in this uh, clockwise order. If you've not seen a tuple before it's just a simple way to group things together. It's a bit like a struct but it's very compatible with the standard library. So as we did before with the edges, the first thing I want to do with my visibility polygon is to clear it. And then we know that we need to do something for each edge in our vector of edges. So a little auto for loop to iterate through all of the edges. Now an edge consists of two points, the start and the end. So for each edge we're going to have to cast at least two rays directly to hit the start and end points. Since I need the angle of the ray, I'm going to start by first calculating the gradient of the ray 
uh, depending on whether we're at the start or the end. So I've used the ternary operator here to select between the start point or the end point, and I'm subtracting from that the source location, OX and OY, giving me two variables, RDX and RDY, which represents the ray vector. Now I'm not bothered what our angle is relative to as long as it's consistent. So I'm just going to create another variable base angle and use the atan2 function using the rdx and rdy values. So this gives us an angle of our ray vector. And we know that for each ray actually we're going to cast three additional rays with a slight deviation between the two. So I'll create a temporary variable called angle which is going to be the angle we will shoot the ray at. So I'll add another for loop to generate the three additional rays we're going to need. And depending on the value j in the for loop, we're going to choose an appropriate angle to cast the ray out to. So in effect, we've gone back on ourselves a little bit here. We've calculated the gradient of the ray so we can work out what the angle is. And then we're using the angle plus or minus a little bit of deviance to generate the vector of the ray again which we can easily do, taking the cosine and sine of the angle. We'll only cast the ray as long as we've specified uh, the radius value to be. As you can probably see, the number of rays we're actually projecting into the scene is growing. And the more complicated our scene is with tiles, the more rays we're going to cast out. However, the one thing we're guaranteed is that our strategy is more optimal than casting rays out in all directions and seeing what happens. At least our rays are guided intelligently to at least some features within the world. And this is where the really chewy part of the algorithm comes, because for every single ray, we now need to check for intersection between the ray and all of the edges in the scene. The algorithm has now come down to a simple line segment intersection test. So we can take two line segments, and we want to work out the point at which they intersect. And one way to think about this is to take a known point on each line, represent the line segment as a vector, therefore the opposing point becomes the existing point plus that vector, and we can add in here a parameter, t1 and t2. Because if t1 is equal to 1, we're at this end of the line, and if t1 is equal to 0, we're at this end of the line. And so we'll find where our intersection point is by looking at the t values. And since we're talking about line segment intersections, go and find the line segment intersection algorithm of your choice. I personally like this one, uh, which I discovered on Stack Overflow. The answer here is actually a code implementation of the answer above. I'll put a link in the description below. Before we can calculate the intersection, we need some additional information. The first of which is we need the vector that represents the edge, which is easy to calculate because it's just one end of the edge subtracted from the other. We'll also need to make sure that the ray isn't going to be collinear with the edge, i.e. it's not going to lie on top of it. So I'll check for that by just looking at the values of the vector component and making sure that they are sufficiently different. For example, if both had a dy of 0, then both the ray and the edge could be horizontal. There's a chance they could overlap and there isn't a single solution point that represents the point of intersection. Now we can calculate the t1 and t2 values using the line segment intersection point algorithm. And in this instance, t1 is the distance along the ray and t2 is the distance along the edge. And so if t1 is positive, that means we're travelling along the ray in the correct direction. And if t2 lies between 0 and 1, then we've definitely hit a line segment. Now that we know we've got an intersection point, what do we do? Well, we're only interested in the intersection point, which is closest to the source point. Even though we've detected uh, intersections along many edges, we want to reject most of them and only retain the one that is closest to the source. And our t1 value represents that information. We don't need to do Pythagoras' theorem here to calculate a distance, because t1 indicates the length along the ray. And so for each ray that I cast, I'm going to store some temporary variables that represent the minimum t1 distance, and I'm also going to store the x and y of the intersection point at that distance. I'll set it to infinity for each ray to start. But if the t1 that represents the intersection point of the ray I've just tested is less than our current closest intersection point, I'm going to replace it. And I'm also going to calculate the new intersection point and angle, of course. Now for all of my rays, once I've calculated where the ray ends, I'm going to add that location to my vector of visible polygon points. Our Calculate Visibility polygon has not quite finished yet, because right now we've got a vector full of points in any particular order. And so I need to sort them based upon the angle. 
Fortunately, the standard library can provide a nice simple routine to do this for us. It provides sort as part of algorithm. And so I'll call the sort routine, giving it the start location of my vector and the end location of the vector, but I'll pass in as the sorting criteria a small lambda function. And it's going to sort based upon the angle. So the two arguments going into the lambda function are references to the two tuples. And we're only interested in the first element of the tuple, which is the angle. So we're going to return true if the angle of the tuple on the left is less than the angle of the tuple on the right. And this will sort it in ascending order. Every frame I want it to convert our tile map to a polymap, but I don't want it to calculate the visibility polygon every single frame. I'm only going to do that when I'm holding down the right mouse button. I also only want to draw anything related to visibility under the same conditions. So I'm going to check that the mouse button is held, but I'm also going to check that the vector of points that we're going to draw at least has something in it. And so now I want to draw my triangle fan. And this is quite easy, now we've got a vector of sorted visibility points. I'm going to go from the start of the vector to almost the end of it. And I'll use the fill triangle routine to draw a triangle from the, the origin point, the source where the mouse is, to the x and y points of two successive visible points in our polygon vector. So this will form a triangle. What I mustn't forget to do is also close the triangle at the end. So we want to draw from the final point to the starting point. This will have to sit outside the loop. So let's take a look. Well, let's try with nothing in. I'm right clicking, I don't see anything. Let's add some obstacles. Oh, well, it looks like a complete and utter mess. Well, bits of it are kind of working, but something's not right. And the problem here is we're, we're information starved. We're only casting out rays wherever we've got information in the scene. So if I put in lots and lots and lots of points for it to reference from, it starts to look a bit more sensible. There's still some horrible glitches though. Particularly, what is this triangle going up towards zero? in the top left. Well, this spurious triangle is because we've assumed that all of our rays will effectively intersect with something. And this might not necessarily be the case, particularly when we have rays which we've adjusted by a slight angle. So we can limit the rays that are added to the vector of polygon points by assuming they're only valid if they have in fact hit something. So I'll only add them if this be valid variable is set to true, and that's only set to true if we have had some sort of collision along the length of the ray. So let's take a look again. Let's add some points in, and I'll draw. Well, at least now we've not got a problem going up towards zero, but things are still looking a bit information starved. In fact, if I now put in lots and lots of points as a boundary, let's see how it looks then. And now it's starting to look a lot more realistic. So what this is telling me is that our rays that don't intersect with anything need to intersect with something. We're going to have to put in an artificial boundary. Now I could do that in our ray code, but what I'm going to do instead is just hard code in some boundaries into our tile map array. So in on user create, where I've just created the world, I'm going to add in a couple of for loops, which draw some parallel horizontal and vertical cells into the world. Let's take a look. Now we can see the boundary has been put in. I'm now illuminating. Everything is lit up. Put in some obstacles. And very nice. Our rays have somewhere to stop now. And that was what was necessary in order to make this look smooth and work. If we just quickly change our fill triangles to draw triangles, now we can see the individual polygons making up the polygon fan around the point from which we're checking for visibility. I'm curious about the number of rays being cast, so I'm going to capture that information and display it. I'll just quickly use the draw string function to display this information to the user. So no rays being cast. And right now, 168 rays being cast for a fairly minimal number of objects. In fact, if we take out a bunch and now cast 72 rays, even though we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 known vertices in the scene. This is because we've got duplication of vertices. 
Fortunately, the standard library can help us out here too. Since our vector of visibility polygon points is sorted, we can use the unique operator to remove any duplicates. Why do we need to draw to the same point multiple times? And so we'll do a before and after comparison. Here is the unique function being called. Again, it's part of algorithm. And I've passed in a lambda function, again, which compares uh, the tuples. But this time it's saying, please reject this particular tuple if the x and y coordinates are similar. In this case, I've said less than 0.1. So I'll create a second variable, raycast2, and compare them. So just a little recap, we've used the unique function to remove all of the duplicates in our sorted vector. It doesn't actually remove anything, the unique function, it just reorganises the vector so that all of the unique stuff is at the start. So anything after the point returned by the unique function, we want to remove, and therefore I'm resizing the vector based upon the distance from the start of the vector to that unique point. I'll now draw how many rays were actually cast versus how many rays were actually drawing on the screen. Let's take a look. So in a blank environment, we're casting 48 rays, but the number of rays that we're drawing is changing between, well, 10 and 13, a little bit of fluctuation. And that's because it depends. If we look at the top right corner here, we can see a bunch of rays, but at certain angles, the rays overlap each other. There's absolutely no point in drawing triangles that we can't see. So let's add in a few obstacles. Now, of course, we'll expect the number of rays to increase. We're casting 192 rays, but now we're only drawing about 50 rays. I think this is quite a significant optimization to make. Lots of features, 840 rays cast, and we're drawing, well, about 25% of them. I'm going to fill in the triangles again now. And so we can see we've got quite a robust line of sight or shadow casting algorithm implemented now. At the start of this video, I made it look a little bit more special because I used a sprite of a light source and modulated where it is white here with that sprite. So this is a bit of pixel game engine trickery now. In Photoshop, I have created a sprite that represents a light source emanating out from a central point. It's a PNG file. I'm going to load the sprite into the pixel game engine. And I'll do that in on user create. I'm now going to do something a little bit novel for this channel. I'm going to do some off-screen rendering. I'm going to create two additional sprites called buffer light ray and buffer light text. And these are going to be surfaces to which I'm going to do some post-processing. But I need to create these in on user create. You'll see I'm not loading a file, I'm just giving them a dimension. They're basically going to be an image buffer to which I'll draw things and then modify. The Pixel Game Engine supports rendering to different targets. By default, it renders to what you can see on the screen. And we can specify the draw target by calling the set draw target function. And by specifying null pointer as the argument, that means there isn't any off-screen draw targets, draw to the main target, which is the screen. So we want to do that before we clear everything to black. And any subsequent drawing calls, so in this case drawing the string, those calls will be redirected to whatever the draw target is. I'm going to use the off-screen buffers to implement a nice lighting effect. The first thing I'll want to do is draw my radial light sprite into the correct location in the buffer. And so I've specified the target buffer, I've erased it to black, and now I'm going to draw the sprite into the correct location, which happens to be my mouse cursor. Now the centre of my sprite, because the sprite is 512 by 512, needs to be offset accordingly. I'm then going to render to the second off-screen buffer the light rays. So I'll clear the buffer to blank first, and all of the fill triangle routines will now be targeted at that buffer. I want to combine these two buffers to draw to the screen. And because we're drawing to the screen now, I set the draw target to null. And I don't have any additive or special blending modes yet in the pixel game engine, so I'm going to iterate through each pixel in my off-screen buffer. And I'm going to check if each pixel has been set. Remember, we cleared it all to blank to begin with, so if it's been set by one of the light rays, it'll no longer be blank. And if that's the case, I want to draw in the current screen location, X and Y, the pixel of my light cast sprite in the corresponding location. Let's take a look. So I can see my sprite has now been drawn wherever my mouse cursor is. Put in some blocks, and the light looks a little bit more realistic. 
we'll notice that the performance has taken a little bit of a hit here. We've gone down to about 18 frames per second. And this is something to do with how the Pixel Game Engine validates all of the pixels in debug mode. If we now change from debug mode to release mode and run the same code, we can see the frame rate is a far more acceptable 100, 200 frames per second on my machine. Let's put in some obstacles. Very nice. The use of off-screen buffers is a little bit alien to the things we've been doing on this channel, but it's a very common practice in all manner of computer graphics. And the fact that we now work with pixels instead of characters allows us to do some higher fidelity effects, and I quite like it. If you've enjoyed this video, firstly please check out some of the links to the uh, resources I've used in this video, uh, they're in the description below. The source code for this algorithm and the Pixel Game Engine is also linked and that's available on the GitHub. Come and have a chat on the Discord, give me a big thumbs up and uh, have a think about subscribing. I'll see you next time. Take care.